Hello? Hey, what's up? How's it going? It's going fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I just thought I was going to push my exam. I spoke to my, my counselors in college. I was also writing one of the direct letters. He, I don't know, he, he basically said, he's one of them, he explained, like, you're applying in June. You don't feel like you're scoring where you want to be scoring. Like, like, if you're within a considerable range, he just for me to move it. Um, Yeah, that's what I would do in your shoes as well. Uh, especially because, yeah, mostly because you're not applying till June. Yeah, the other issue was, uh, I'd be, I have like a lot of stuff going on the moment I come back to college. Like in, in terms of that first week, in terms of like club, um, like club leadership and having to present and all that. I just don't know how I'd be able to fit in the AMC stuff or the, you know, like the full lengths and all that, reviewing them. Mm -hmm. The last, I don't know. That's just the way I saw it. I just feel like if yeah. I study throughout the semester, the main thing I'm scared about is forgetting stuff. Yeah. Which, but uh, I think if I do on key, that will help a lot in terms of like the forgetting curve or yep, yep. whatnot. whatnot. Um, and just for me, the way I saw it is because I'm going to be in college for like the winter break, I'm likely not going to be going back home to New York. I'm going to be in Florida at the University of Miami, um, studying and I'm not really going to have any distractions. And I, I plan on signing up for the exam before school even starts, like in January. So My hope is those four final weeks of absolute zero distractions like can benefit me a lot. And obviously studying throughout the semester as well. Mm -hmm. Just because I, I laid out my schedule, like I made my schedule the semester with the thought in my head that if there's any sort of way I can push the exam, like at least the schedule is not terrible. Uh -huh. I mean, you I don't know, that's the way I saw it, but like you're going into your seat senior year. Yes, yes, I am. Got it. And so, yeah, it could be difficult fitting in MCAT prep into your, like, you know, the, the, so, so what, what, yeah, what type of classes are you going to be taking? Well, uh, in terms of classes, I'm only going to be taking, like, I have 12 credits and five of them are likely going to be research. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, like the research should it's like a more laid back because like I, I know the person I'm doing it for and you know if I don't come in like the amount I'm supposed to come in in a given week because I have like more stuff on my plate they they're they don't really care mm -hmm. I'm only taking two classes uh one of them is genetics which will actually help me a lot because I I, I suck at like MCAT genetics but that's probably the only hard class and um yeah what's the other class It's a health management class. It's like a Got minor it. of mine. It's it shouldn't be bad at all. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. Um, I plan on taking a full length every two weeks. So what I needed to ask you is mm -hmm. your opinion on that. And like, is there a certain threshold where like, because like I would have taken 20 full lengths by January if I take one every two weeks. Like, is there a point to be taking that many? Is there a point where, what? Like, is there like, A point where the the curve just like flattens out in terms of oh. taking third party full lengths. I know AMC full lengths are amazing, but uh -huh. like all all TS ones and stuff. Uh huh. I mean, uh, probably like you'll you'll hit the diminishing return. Well, actually, I mean it de depends on how you do. Like, but but yeah, I don't really think so. I don't really think that there's much. diminishing returns um for the tests i know i did like a good number of like blueprint tests a good number of altius tests um i didn't actually do like new world like most people do so you also have that under your belt um but yeah i wouldn't say that there's really diminishing return i mean like if, if it's if it's like you know if you're not really like understanding stuff um Like I've had maybe like one or two students that um 
that weren't like really under like they would take a test go over it but not really understand it and then take another test go over it not really understand it and and so that like I, this is like probably like one or two students that i've had like maybe like two years ago um and they just were not improving so for them it was definitely some type of diminishing returns but uh for pretty much everyone else uh yeah i would say that there isn't really diminishing returns the more you practice the better you get at it and especially if you do like blueprint or and or altius um as well as like the world stuff so i think um yeah yeah so i think uh taking as many tests as possible uh is going to be good for you okay All right. Um, one other thing uh, also is I was wondering if we can, well, actually, I might email you about this next week, but maybe set up a time where we can meet just once a week, mm -hmm. but have it be weekly um, from the start. Maybe it might be biweekly for a bit and then weekly again, but mm -hmm. um, I think I'll email you about that, but it would probably be like on Tuesday. So, or Thursdays, I don't know. Yeah. What well, works for you. Oh yeah. Like either one, you know, would work depending on day. Um, here is in, in the chat, I'm putting a link to like a published paper that's like literally called, you know, MCAT tips. And there's um well enhancing your oh you know what this actually is a good opportunity for us to enhance your reading skills because that's something that you know before when when you were taking when you were planning on taking your test you know like this summer um i didn't really get into because it's hard it, it would take time to get you're like get used to kind of like reading more but um but now that you we have more time we can have you actually like read some more so i would say in addition to mcat prep for you to like you know take some time like maybe each day or i don't know like every couple of days to like read like uh i have it all in like a document called like soft skills so Certain periodicals like, you know, The New Yorker is really good. Um, Harper's is really good. Certain books as well. But that's just stuff to improve your reading skills, which is a major part of this test. And then also you'll see in the paper that I sent you that um, it says more. So like here, I can even like share my screen here so okay you can see this yeah all right so we can go down to study plan and enhance your reading skills so um so yeah processing information while reading is a skill which can take years to develop the best way to strengthen this skill is by simply reading as much as possible. While preparing for the MCAT, one should read a variety of forms of literature, including news articles, books, and novels with a wide range of topics in both fiction and nonfiction, um, occasional scientific journal. Um, okay, I have this highlighted just because, like, it mostly says that, like, you know, you don't want to have even, like, like, even the mere presence of a cell phone near, near you could impede cognition so you definitely want to not have phones near you which i don't think is a problem for you but um here also more than any other study technique using full-length practice tests will be the best strategy to conclude preparations for the mcat recreating the atmosphere setting and length of the real exam while taking practice exams will help students to develop endurance and the attitude required on test day uh etc so I have a 
document here and the shared document. Oh, and this, by the way, is like the vocab builder that I, there's probably like newer ones that are better or whatever, but this was the one that I specifically used when I was studying for the um, SAT. And you see how like, you know, Ben or Bene or whatever is Latin for well, and it goes into that. Um, but here in the soft skills over here, um, I have, well, this link has some really good reading stuff. Uh, these are some periodicals that could be good to read. These are some books that could be good to read, which I also have in this books, um, section here. So that could be something like that. We, I mean, yeah, so that, I mean, that could be something that we can maybe see if we can slide into your schedule but uh but yeah it's not it's like not going to be as high priority as like doing straight up cars passages but i think that we can we can work on all those areas like including cars uh you know in the upcoming months do you think that reading scientific literature also will help because i'll likely be doing that also uh-huh so yeah according to the to that paper it says that it could help um and that could help as well because you know all of the science passages are based on those types of scientific papers but i think that like yeah sure that'll help like simply reading like it ultimately doesn't matter what you read as long as you read you know as much as as possible like just uh, you know just try to like fill your days with reading as much as you can um, on anything. Uh, that'll be good for you no matter what, because this entire test is a reading test. Um, but yeah, you'll be reading lots of scientific papers. That'll help. The genetics class that you'll be taking, that'll help. Um, you know, you could probably even like have MCAT genetic questions or uh, genetic genetics questions um, and passages that you can even maybe like ask your TA or professor. Yeah. Like it would be good to get their perspective on that since they're, you know, maybe they're used to genetics and stuff. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a wise class to be, to be taking. Um, but, but yeah, I think that works out for you. Um, I think that's a good schedule that you have. And I think it's like very, very doable. Um, so I think like, it'll be like, yeah, you'll be taking a good number of practice exams. Um, and you know, I think, I, I think what I really want to see improve is the, I mean like everything, but obviously, like, yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, car. See, the thing is like, this is not a good um thought have, but you really right. wanna Oh, do you hear me now or it's still yeah, yeah. yeah, what's up? Okay. I can hear you now. Oh wait, actually now I can't hear you. <laughs> oh now I can hear you. I fixed my microphone. Hello? Yeah. It's better? Yeah. Yes. What I was saying is that I thought that I would be able to improve everything with the cars and then just improve that last, but I know that's not a good way of thinking about it. Wait, say that say that again? Am I cutting out again? Uh just for one word. You said something about the word before cars. I thought that I would be able to improve everything bef except, you know. The critical now like car section oh, okay and then improve it last mm -hmm. that, that's not a good, like mindset to have 
Oh yeah, yeah. So you said that's the one that you don't think you can improve on, but that you want to, that you think you can improve on it last. So okay, uh, like focus on everything else first. You know. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I think that with cars, it's something that it's it's like the hardest thing to cram. So I think what we should do is have you do like you know one or two cars passages like either a day or every other day um starting from like the get-go so i think that is something that you can improve on and that it, i think it's just that you haven't been doing car cars as much but i think that it's something you, you can 100% improve on. Um, so I would definitely recommend doing a few cars passages, like, you know, either every day or every other day. Um, and uh, with enough practice, like it'll take, it'll take a lot of practice until it like clicks. And then when it clicks and you get like that logic down from the passages, um, you know, it'll work well for you. In addition to just the fact that every time you do a car's passage, it counts towards reading practice. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll be doing today. Then, uh, final question before we get into the like problems, mm -hmm. because yeah. Um. So, do you recommend I try to do a full length every two weeks? See where it takes me. I was gonna do one on Monday. Um, let's see. All right, so 160 days divided by seven, 22.8 weeks. And divide that by two, that'll be 11 tests right right but remember that i'd be taking one every single one. Ooh. wait maybe maybe if you go back to like that position you were in like when you're sitting back more yeah talk now <laughs> hello yeah yeah go on wait was i like okay w was it super loud i don't know i think okay yes. anyways yeah, where you have to keep in mind, I'd be taking a full length every single week the last month. Oh, okay. So, so that will be just fifteen then total. More or less. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So, so every how many weeks should I be taking it right now? The two or three. Oh, so yeah, if you did it every two weeks, uh. That'll be 11 tests. And then um, I just added like the, well, I guess I would have to subtract two to get nine. And then every week would be four more. So that'll be 13 tests. So yeah, I think every two weeks would be would be good. Um, doing Anki every day. And if you have time, do like maybe some cards passages, maybe some passages, you know, uh, you world passages and stuff and um yeah every two weeks take a take a full length and then i guess during that winter break you will be taking a test you know each week but at the end of the day or at the end of you know the you know january mid-january uh you'll have taken um 13 tests so i think that's a good amount okay mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I guess we can do the, um, the problems that you sent me from yesterday. Mm hmm Real quick. Yep. So, 
Yeah, you could open up that PDF and share your screen and we can go from All right. there. I said to request report. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. All right. So if you remember, so this was the question where like right away we know that we can eliminate A and B, right? Yeah. Okay. And then it was the question of whether it like, you know, it's C D. And so I just straight up use the thin lens equation and you know the magnification, you know, I got for converging was negative one. Um, the negative indicates that it's inverted. I have to know that. So if a ma if a magnification is negative, it's inverted. Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Signs signs are important here. Um, because then when we did the calculation for the diverging lens, a diverging lens means that its focal length or focal point must be negative. Okay. So for diverging, you see I wrote, you know, uh, must be uh, negative here. And so I just, then I plugged in one over negative F is equal to one over two F object distance minus one over I. And I subtracted the one over two F on both sides to get, you know, this over here. And I need to have the same denominator. So I multiplied this over here by 2 over 2. And then I get negative 2 over 2f two minus 1 over 2f is equal to negative 3 over 2f, which is 1 over i. So i must be negative 2f over 3, right? Yeah. And then I plugged it into the magnification formula, which is negative image distance, which is negative 2f over 3 divided by object distance, which is 2f. And this gives me positive 1 third. Positive means it's upright. Uh, wait, how do you know that the f less should be less than 0? Sorry. I... Yeah, because it's a diverging lens. If it... Oh. Yep. Um, got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we end up with um, an image that's upright, but it's one third of its size. So it's basically, you know, um, so that, that would mean that compared to, so that would mean that like, okay, so this is the height of the converging, uh, the height of the image for the converging lens. And this is the height of the image for the diverging lens. And we can see that the convert the height of the image for the converging lens is three times that of the height of the diverging lens. Okay. okay. Okay, yes, yeah, so the answer would be D, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. All right. So for this one, so this question's a saying uh ask saying uh okay, a saturated solution of CuF2 dissolved in pure water at 25C has a Cu2 plus ion concentration of 7.4 times 10 to the negative three molar. Um, if measured at the same temperature, what is the copper ion concentration in a saturated solution of CuF2 dissolved in water that also contains 0.2 molar NaF? So what's happening here is, well, what we're going to see happen in most of these questions uh, is like, you know, a common ion effect. So here I just took the KSP that was given in the passage over here 
And I set that equal to, you know, concentration of the copper and then concentration of the fluoride uh, squared because we have two over here. We have uh, two fluoride ions, right? Yeah. So, so then I just plugged in 0 0.2 molar for the fluoride ion because I'm getting it from the NAF. And so I get the 0 0.2 squared is 0 0.04, which is 4 EU negative 2. And then to solve for copper concentration, I just divide the 4 E negative 2 on both sides. So I'm dividing it by, you know, the KSP by that over here. And I kind of uh, rounded like the 1.6 to be like 2. So 2 over 4, which is 1 half, which is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 E neg 4. Um, oh, yeah. Whoops. Um, this should be neg 5. But I took the 0.5 E neg 4 and I turned it into 5 E neg 5. Okay. So the closest thing to that is, and this is me, you know, um, rounding up. So our answer must be similar to this, just a little bit smaller. And so it'll be this one. I think we did see you too close. Oh yeah. So it seems like whenever your mouth gets below the Okay, okay. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. I don't know what you <laughs> Why didn't we use this plus illustration? Uh, um uh, seven point four that they gave us. Sorry, say that again. Why so this the CU two plus concentration they gave us? Mm-hmm. 7.4. Why didn't we use that? 7.4? Times 10 to negative third. Oh, yeah. So that's just when we have this. Okay. Right? But they're asking about if we took this and we threw it in to this. Mm -hmm. So, so we're the, so we're putting, so we're putting in this CuF2, which is a solid. Like, okay, if we put it into something that just contains water, we would get this value. But we're putting it in something that has water and a uh, NaF. So that's why we can't use this concentration of copper because that's the concentration of copper when you put CuF2 uh, into water, just straight up water with nothing else in it. So there's no common ion effect there. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, what we also could have done would be since we know that there's going to be a common ion effect, we know that we're going to get a decrease in amount of copper, right? So we could eliminate these two choices right away. Okay, okay. Next. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, this was your favorite question, I think. So, oh yeah, I made a mistake here. This is supposed to say lower. But yeah, so basically, um, all right, so like, uh, let's just look at, so I'm going to go through each. So like, um, so B, adding dilute sodium hydroxide. So the, they're telling us that the KSP for the copper hydroxide is this amount, which is low, a lower KSP than CuF2 which means that it's going to uh persist or well let me say this first okay if we add dilute sodium hydroxide what we're going to be what what's going to form will be this the copper hydroxide okay 
And this has a lower KSP than CUF2. And so we're trying to see, like the question's asking us, what would increase the amount that dissolve uh, of this that dissolves, aka increasing the copper ion concentration. Right? So if we added sodium hydroxide, it would turn into this, which has a lower KSP than CuF2 and therefore will precipitate turning into a solid, thereby decreasing that copper ion concentration. So that's the opposite of what we want. Mm -hmm. um, and then for C, diluting the solution with aqueous potassium fluoride. So that's essentially the same, like similar to what happened in uh, question 10, um, where like in, yeah, in question 10, right, we're adding NAF, producing a common ion effect that will reduce the amount of copper that gets uh, dissociated into the water. So if you add potassium fluoride, adding more fluoride will shift left, more precipitation, which means less copper ion. So it's more the solid. What's up? It would, it would be more the solid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm, okay. Yep. And then D, evaporating some solution to decrease the solution uh solution volume. Um that would increase the concentration of the ions like this and this, which would mean that it would shift it to the left. Okay. So mm -hmm. it would be A. Yeah. So now if you go up to the part, uh the passage part, and yeah, like I guess zoom zoom in. So they have a little they they, they kind of say uh, certain things that can help us out here that I didn't really look at the first time around. Like here, it says the dissociated F minus or F negative ion is mildly basic, right? Yeah. So if we go back down to that question, if we added dilute nitric acid, which would cause, you know, H plus to form, since the fluoride ion is mildly basic, it should, you know, attach or for, form a bond with the proton to give you hydrofluoric acid. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that means that the fluoride, the, the fluoride at the end of this gets taken up, like getting used. So we don't have that much of this anymore or maybe i'll use a down arrow we don't have that much of this anymore so that will shift that reaction to the right so mm -hmm. that would be nitric acid Say again. What exactly is dilute nitric acid? Just that. Okay, I, I feel like it's like so it's like you add the dilute nitric acid and that reacts with the, the basic fluoride. Uh-huh. Um 
Mm -hmm. The F ion. That's basic. Yep. So if it's mildly basic, it's going to want to be a proton acceptor. Right? And nitric acid as an acid will be a proton donor. So it'll take a uh, fluoride ion out of the solution, causing the shift to go to the right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so because the F decreases, uh -huh. C is going to precipitate. So uh, what is going to happen? CuF2. Uh, it's gonna dissolve. Yeah. If it goes to the left, it precipitates. If you go, if you go what? To the left? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything, yeah. If it goes to the left, it'll precipitate. If it goes to the right, it'll, you know, dissolve. So, yeah, that's what we're looking for, that rightward shift. When, um, when Q is greater than KSP, it just precipitates? Uh, Q is greater than KSP. Um, I guess. Let's see. K so KSP would be like the the concentration at which it will. Um, or like the highest concentration at which it'll uh dissolve or dissociate. Um, so I guess if Q is higher than that, it will have to shift, um, I guess left, but I wasn't really thinking of this in terms of like Q. No, I know. I'm just asking in general. Let's see. Okay. All right. So if Q is greater than KSP, we consider the solution to be super saturated. And therefore, we want Q to decrease, which means that it will shift left to form more precipitate. Tate. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, KSP is the maximum amount of uh, or maximum product of the ionic concentrations that can exist without forming a precipitate. And so, so yeah, if Q is larger than that maximum amount, it's too high and it must get lower to, you know, equal KSP. And so that reaction will uh, form a precipitate to lower that amount. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So next is 12. Oh. Here is a image that I'm putting in the chat. So it's for this reaction with barium sulfate. And if you have Q larger than KSP, it says um, it's super saturated. So um, it will shift it to the left, forming more of the precipitate. And then, you know, Opposite for Q is less than KSP. Um, and then Q is equal to KSP. Got it. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. And then 
unsaturated and then so like so it it does i guess it didn't really tell you the details but for the second one where it says q is less than ksp and it's unsaturated it should move to the, it should shift to the right um and then if q is equal to ksp it's just gonna be wherever it is no no shifting yep so okay let's see okay suppose a research technician wants to separate an aqueous mixture of CuF2 and BaF2 and they give us the BaF2 KSP and it's a um let's see by precipitating CuF2 from the solution what what should be added to the solution to perform the separation okay Um, okay, so, uh, so if you look at B first, would shift left of, would shift left both the reaction, like, causing more CUF to precipitate as well as BAF to precipitate, because F is in both of those. So if we, if it causes more precipitate of both of these things, it wouldn't let us set, be able to separate uh, the two by precipitating just one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um C would just shift um the barium fluoride left or creating more of the barium fluoride um precipitate which is what we don't want. We want the CuF2 to precipitate. Yeah. Um D, if you add H2O, that would increase the solubility of both. So that won't work. And so it must be A because that will, you know, increase that amount of copper ions, shifting it to the left to make more of the CuF2 solid. Okay. No, this one makes sense. Mm -hmm. D just so D would just increase what like what the, the amount of water that dissolved in uh yeah so uh D would increase the concentration of all of the ions just because you have a lot you have more of the solvent meaning more solubility got it okay mm -hmm. all right Oh, yeah, this one, um, oh yeah, this one was tough because of the way that it was worded. But yeah, during the separation of a fully dissolved mixture of CuF two and BaF two, um, from a saturated aqueous solution, a lab technician chose to use the common ion effect to precipitate CuF two from the solution rather than F uh, BaF two pretty much what we were doing in the previous question. Which of the following statements does not explain why precipitating CuF2 is the better choice for the separation procedure? So we're trying to, so, so we're trying to find, okay, so the person is trying to use the common ion effect to precipitate CuF2, and we need to find an answer that essentially says, or or does not, so, so we want to look for an answer that says that we're using the common ion effect. And I say answer, when I, when I say answer, I mean 
we want it to say that because that would not explain why precipitating is a better choice. So, so if we just go through each of these, so like A, CuF2 is less soluble and more responsive to small changes in common ion concentrations. So I wrote that's true because it has a lower KSP compared to the Ba of two. Now, that's a true statement that does not tell you why it's better to precipitate CuF2. So that won't be our answer. Um, and then B, adding F minus as the common ion would cause, uh, oh wait, sorry, C. There are fewer moles of Cu2 plus to remove from the solution than moles of Ba2 plus. And that's also true because of CuF2 having a lower KSP. And if it has a lower KSP than BAF2, it's less soluble. If it's less soluble, less of it will turn into Cu2 plus compared to Ba2 plus. Mm -hmm. All right, then D. Um, oh yeah, and then C won't be what we're looking for because we want to see why is, you know, uh, CUF2 preferred to be precipitated. Um, okay, D, precipitating BAF2 would require a greater number of common ions to be added to the solution. That's also true because um, since BAF2 has a higher KSP and we have more moles of BA2+, plus, we would need a larger amount of common ions to uh, precipitate that. So I wrote okay. true because it has higher KSP needing more F minus ions to precipitate. So if something has a higher KSP, that means the what concentration is higher? Yeah, so which means molars moles is higher. Max amount of something that dissolves, right? So like if we had 3.2 E negative six, you know, molar BAF2, it's going to start to precipitate because KSP is the max like concentration of something that dissolves. And you can see that for CuF2, it's a smaller number, meaning that um that it the maximum amount that can uh dissolve in water in water um is smaller than that of BAF2. Yeah. And um so that's yeah, so that's KSP. And then what were you asking? Oh, you're saying higher amount or uh, of KSP means what were you asking? It's like a higher KSP means a more a higher concentration that's dissolving or like a higher yeah. molar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More amount that of uh that dissolves, you can say that you know a higher KSP would just mean a higher solubility. Okay. Yep. So, so yeah. So for B now, adding fluoride as the common ion would cause CuF2 to precipitate. Now, that's true, but we're trying to look for, because the lab tech, wants to use the common ion effect to precipitate CuF2. And we want to find a statement that does not explain why 
you know, this is a better choice for the sep or precipitating CUF2 is, is a good thing to do. So B, I wrote that true, but explains why CUF2 would precipitate using the common ion effect. And that's the answer or choice that we don't want because they're asking, you know, what does not explain why it's good to precipitate CUF2. But is that because, like, why is that bad? Because BAF2 will also pre precipitate or? Well, BAF2 will also precipitate, that's true. But more of the CUF2 would precipitate because it has a smaller, um, you know, KSP. So therefore requires, it's like, you know, this thing over here, D, like precipitating BAF2 requires a greater number of common ions compared to CUF2. So yeah, so this is the only one that essentially tells you why um, like the lab tech wanted to use the common ion effect to precipitate uh CUF2. It's so it's a broader statement. It's a, it's, it's a broad statement you're saying? Yeah, like a broader statement than um saying like would cause it to precipitate um instead of BAF2 something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's why yeah, I didn't really like this that much because if it, if it said would cause you know more CUF2 to precipitate you know than BAF2 that would at least explain you know this part of the technician using the common ion effect to precipitate CUF2 from the solution rather than BAF2 right and B doesn't really show that. Like, it's not saying that it's more than BAF2. Uh, F2. So I thought this was a little, you know, not uh, the most fair in terms of, like, the wording here. But, but yeah, that would be the only one that would, um, you know, answer the question of why it would not be better to precipitate CUF2. Okay. All right. Now, this one also involved something in the passage that, you know, I didn't even look at the first time we tried it. So let's go to the passage. So, yeah, sorry. I don't know why I, the passage I made so small, but here. So at the very bottom here, it says that coordinate. So like copper ions can have an affinity to form coordinate bonds with the lone pair of nitrogen atoms in amines. And we have that here in reaction two. And if excess amine ligands are present, coordinate bonds like that shown in reaction two will continue to form until each Cu2 plus in solution is coordinated with four nitrogen atoms. So any... So like, you know, all of this gets used up here to get to turn into these coordination complexes. So in other words, we are running out of the copper cation. Yeah. And so that's going to be something that can, that, that's going to, play a role here. So, okay. Look, Smith and Arkansas. Yep, so if excess methylamine is added to a saturated aqueous CuF2 Solution that contains some undissolved CuF2 solid at the bottom of the solution. The amount of the dissolved CuF2 solid that remains will. So since the forming of these coordination complexes decrease the concentration of dissolved copper ions, 
that should push that reaction to the right, mm -hmm. causing that dis undissolved CuF2 solid to dissolve and turn into like the ions. So the amount of the undissolved one will uh, decrease. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So if you add like, so are they counting NH3 as this, like, are they counting the NR3 the same as like methylamine? Mm -hmm. Yep. This is the amine part. And then this is just the R part. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and so here, if we get, if this is this and we're using it up, right, the amount of this decreases, and so it should shift this to the right. Okay. So answer is, the answer is B? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. This is all the Chatelier. Yeah. Chatelier, whatever. Chatelier. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Okay. Based on the passage, which of the following procedures would assist in separating an aqueous mixture of copper chloride and copper sulfate salts at uh ninety degrees uh Celsius? Now I don't remember if they mentioned well. Okay, so let's just see. Um Wait, so I don't remember if they mentioned in the passage anything about CuCl2 or Cu sulfate salts. Um, can we see if they mentioned anything about like about that? I just want to make sure. You can go up to the. Sorry. Um, I I forget. I'm sharing half the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess just um so in terms of um solubility, seems like the chloride one is more soluble. Okay. So all right, yeah, we can go back. Okay, so, um, okay, we want to see how can we separate these two, right? So, okay, if we, pull the solution mixtures to 5C, hold on, I'm just going to open this on my own thing. So. Yeah. Look at that again. Okay, I mean, it's still at five C, it's still this same uh, copper chloride is still more soluble, but everything solub everything solubility goes down anyway. So uh, yeah, so okay. Roman numeral one, uh, if you cool the solution mixture to 5C from that like graph with all the different lines for the different things, uh, you see that solubility gets lowered when you have a lower temperature. 
And so that would mean more precipitate can form, which can mean that uh, it's easier to separate them. Yeah. So if it's five, mm -hmm. um, can you explain it again? Sorry. Yep. So um, if it's, so I guess first, if it's at 90, you see these solubilities. Yeah. And then if it's five, which will probably be something like here. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, yeah. It'll be like that. So overall, if you cool it, the solubilities decrease. Mm -hmm. And if the solubilities decrease, that means that we're going to have more of the solid precipitate. Okay. Yep. So if you cool it to 5C, it'll lower the solubilities, making more precipitates, and that can assist in separating that, separating those salts. Um. And then Roman numeral two says, add sodium sulfate to the uh, solution mixture. So that'll dissociate into sodium, you know, whatever, two sodium pluses, and then a, a sulfate ion. So I wrote increase in the sulfate ion concentration. And then, you know, this path, this passage seems to be all about, as you said, Le Chatelier's principle, and then also common ion effect. So this is a common ion effect because it means we're going to have more sulfate. So for the reaction for copper sulfate, we're going to have an excess of that sulfate. So it's going to shift that reaction to the left, producing more copper sulfate precipitate. And that makes it easier to separate it from the copper chloride. Yeah. How about three, though? Yep. So this is kind of like that question with the adding nitric, uh, dilute nitric acid. Right. So if we lower, uh, if we lower the pH of the mixture, we're going to have an increase in H plus concentration and that can form complexes with the, uh, oh, sorry, complexes of copper with water or other ligands in acidic conditions, but nothing that will precip that will pr uh, preferentially precipitate one of the salts. Mm -hmm. So that essentially is telling us that the protons, Protons what? Oh yeah. So the protons will can form complexes with the copper ions. But it can also, I mean, like I guess it could also form something with the sulfate ion. But essentially what it does, like lowering the pH, will just make it so that um that we have those uh copper ions being able to form complexes with water and other ligands in that in an acidic condition that will make it so that more of that precipitate will dissolve and we have more of like the dissolved ions uh, rather than the opposite. Like it'll shift the reaction to the right. Okay.
So should we go over the next passage? Yep, we can do that. Should I share it or you're going to share it? You can share. Okay. Speaker is at rest and on a tabletop and produces a steady sound of constant frequency. A guitar is placed near the speaker. After some time, the speaker is turned off and a guitarist notices that one of the guitar strings is vibrating in a standing wave pattern. Uh, which of the following statements about standing waves? about the standing waves on the guitar string is true. Um, okay, let's see. The frequency of the standing waves is lower than the frequency of the waves produced by the speaker because the sound waves lose energy before they reach the guitar string. Um, well, I don't think that the energy should change, but let me see. Um, the wavelength of standing waves is shorter than the wavelength of the waves produced by the speaker because the sound wave, okay, it says lose energy again. Both waves have the same frequency because the standing waves on the string are a result of the sound waves produced by the speaker. Both waves have the same wavelength because the standing waves on the string are a result. Oh, wait. It's like the same thing. Wavelength. Okay, I guess it could be one of those, well, wait, things where, because we're, it seems like we're having a different, so we're having a change in medium. And usually when you have that, you can have a change in wavelength, but not in frequency. Um, so, why is that? Uh, so like it's something I usually see with light waves when light waves enter into like a new medium. Um, the wavelength can change, the, the speed can change, but the frequency can't change. I think it has something to do with maybe like how frequency is like number of cycles per time. Um, but that's something that I, it's kind of hard to... guess really explain but yeah it's kind of like a thing that you can you can take you see
Yeah, I think it's just that. It's just that the. Um, that when you go when you change mediums, uh, you change the speed of the wave, and that would result in a change in the wavelength. So, uh, since you know the speed isn't something that's held constant, um, it shouldn't cause a change in frequency. But I think that's like something that you can kind of like black box and just kind of think of as something that just memorize it <laughs> yeah i guess so yeah okay like how do you know it's changing medium exactly it like why because the sound comes off the speaker and to the guitar yeah so I mean, like, I, I want to make, so, like, is the answer C? Yes. All right, so, yeah, so it goes from the, yeah, it goes through the air, and then it goes into a solid, the solid being the guitar string. But well, let's mm -hmm. see what they wrote in terms of frequency saying the same. Um Okay. Yeah, so I guess just know that frequency, when you go from like one medium to another medium, um, like a wave, like whether it's light or in this case sound, um, what changes is the speed and the wavelength, but the frequency will never change if you're going from one medium to another. Okay. Mm -hmm. Probably this. Uh, let's see. Researchers are screening bacterial chromosomes for mutations affecting protein function after using DNA sequencing analysis and analyzing the gel electrophoresis results. They identify a sequence on the gel with a single point mutation in which the fourth nucleotide has been changed From adenine to cytosine, this sequence is shown below. Which of the following gel electrophoresis diagrams obtained from DNA sequencing analysis uh, represents the sequence? So, um, so if I remember correctly, like DNA sequencing, like Sa Sanger kind of thing. I think it's like Sanger or something. Um, involves like using DD NTPs, like di deoxy. Um, like nucleotides, which since they don't have like that three prime OH group, it's not going to can it's gonna end the uh end that sequence. So we want to see what represents the sequence. So let's see. Okay, so if they're going from five to three. T T A C G. Um maybe I can look for that first if I go from five to three. So T G A C G for that one. I, I don't even I don't know if it's gonna be like a complementary thing or not, but let's see. This one is gonna be T T A. C, G, okay, maybe. Let's look at C. So for C, it's C, G, T, 
T A A and then for D G C A T T. Okay. My question is just like, I, I'm not sure. Like, so why is it? I always forget why the three prime is so uh, significant because is that where the phosphate group binds? Like, yep. So, you know, I always say whenever you see a hydroxyl group, you know, think nucleophile. And, yep, that's what it does. In fact, so, yeah. Well, I mean, when it, when, it's, when it's not there, why does it stop? Like, why does it stop for a given, whether it's A, C, or G? Yeah, so what they're using for, like, the DDNTPs would be, like, you know, just something like that without that three prime hydroxyl group. And if we don't have that, we can't, like, because what we're doing here is that we're using the three prime hydroxyl group to bind and make a phosphodiester bond with this phosphate group that would be attached to, you know, a different uh, nucleotide. Yeah. So that's why we need that three, three prime end because it hasn't that OH group. But how do we know like uh, what it's gonna stop at? Oh, so for Sanger sequencing, we use dideoxy, because this is just deoxy. Like RNA, whoops. RNA has, is just ribonucleic acid with these two hydroxyl groups which is why RNA is so unstable because this can attack this and mess that up. So that's just ribonucleic acid. DNA deoxy does not have the two prime OH group. So that's this. And then the DD, the dideoxy has no two prime nor a three prime OH group which means it can't nucleophilically attack a phosphate, which means that it cannot continue uh, polymerization. And that's just something that they use in Sanger sequencing. Or okay. So when you look at these, how do you know the order? Oh yeah, so on the bottom it says five prime, on the top three prime. So I mean, either, either since... So like the sequence that they gave us is like five to three. So that's why I'm looking at these five to three, but I could be wrong. They could be looking for three to five, what's complementary, in which case I would have to choose something that would be like, if you, if you scroll back up. So, oops. So you can see how the sequence that they're giving us is five to three. Yeah. And so, so my thoughts are either we're going to look for this exact sequence in a five to three, like, you know, pattern, or if we did three to five and complementary, it would be A, A, T, G, oops, G, C, five. So, so it's going to be either one of these, right? So if I'm looking for the three prime one with AAT, I would go from like the top to the bottom. So, okay, so this, this is five, three, but three, five would just be G, C, A, G, T, five. Then here it would be A, oops. G, C, A, T, T. So this is five, three. This is three, five. Um, do you see what I'm kind of doing here? I mean, so kind of. Uh-huh. Yeah, so like, 
Um, so if I'm trying to write down what the sequence is five to three, I'm like starting here with the T and then the next one is this G and the next one is this A followed by the C followed by this G. Okay. I mean, yeah, so... Okay, so what would it be B? Um, let's see. Let me see, like, C and D again. Okay. Pretty sure the answer is C, actually. But... Okay, you said it was C? I think so. Either B or C, I don't remember. I mean, I could just submit it. No, it was B, it was B, okay. All right, good. So, yeah, because for B, I got the exact same sequence. Um. So, okay, if we, if we go up, so this, so if I go from five to three, I get, you know, T here, another T, A, C, and G. And that's five, three. Yeah. Yeah. So I was trying, yeah, I wasn't sure about, you know, whether or not we're looking for what's complementary to that or exactly that. But when I looked at each of them from five to three, B was the only one that was exactly the same. That's the thing, though. How do I know that if it, whether or not it was a complementary one or not? Um. So I guess let's see. If they're trying, they're saying what? Oh, I guess like I guess they're saying represents the sequence. So if they said something like you know complementary to the sequence or like you know something else but it just says represents the sequence yeah okay well i don't know how much time we're gonna have for this but we can try yeah. uh One sec. Not NFTs, that's funny. I actually just realized, yeah. Um, okay.
Maybe we could try it out. All right, let's see. Alzheimer's disease is a progressive uh, condition affecting memory and cognition that can be pathologically characterized by the presence of neurofibrillary tangles, NFTs. NFTs, aggregates of hyperphosphorylated tau proteins that have dissociated from microtubules are believed to contribute to neuronal degradation and subsequent AD symptoms. Let's see. Um, in general, ribosomes initiate translation of mRNA by binding the seven methyl guanosine cap um, present at the end of the five prime UTR, untranslated region of the mRNA molecule. However, researchers believe that tau protein translation initiation can occur without recognition of this cap. Okay. Um, this alternative mechanism referred to as cap independent translation indicates that ribosomes are recruited by internal ribosome entry sites, IRES, generally located in the five prime UTR of the mRNA sequence. Okay, so it seems like um, in general, ribosomes initiate translation by binding to the seven cap, but for the tau protein translation can be independent of that cap. So they're probably going to, so let's see, translation. Proportional to the M7GPP, but it could be like tau translation where it's just some type of I, R E S instead. Okay. To determine the initiation mechanism of tau mRNA translation, neuroblastoma cells of AD mice were transfected with two different DNA constructs. Figure one. So construct one contained the five prime UTR of tau mRNA extracted from cells displaying NFTs. Construct two included the five prime UTR of the beta globulin gene, which normally codes for a plasma protein, the luciferase um, reporter genes, Ranilla and Photonis, were also included in the two constructs. So construct one, five cap, and that's like the, oh, that's the tau protein thing. And we see IRES there, the ribosome entry sites. And then we have construct two, which is for some other um, protein that I would imagine uses just like the, the seven cap or whatever. So, okay, so that's what we have and Okay, Lucifer. Okay, Luciferase expression, a uh, gene expression from the co uh, constructs was monitored in the presence of various concentrations of a synthetic st uh, seven cap analog, figure two, translation of Ranilla luciferase, mRNA, depended on ribosomal binding to the seven cap of the mRNA, but translation of photonis 
luciferase. I already, okay. So this would be proportional to the renilla. And this should be proportional to the photonus. And so figure two, luciferase activity in neuroblastoma cells exposed to this seven cap analog. So we see construct one um, have high luciferase activity. And that makes sense because compound one has the IRES and for the tau protein. Construct two has a different type of protein that isn't tau that wouldn't use IRES, but we don't see that it's using like the seven M7 cap or anything. So that seems to be like zero luciferase activity. And, uh, and then, oh, they have different ones for the different. Okay. So yeah. the construct one photonus is the highest, which makes sense because that's what that uses. And the Ranilla is still decently high. Um, and it's going down. Uh, and then for the construct two, for the Photonus, it's like nothing, which makes sense again. For the Ranilla, it's a little bit higher, and that makes sense again. Um, so, okay. What exactly is luciferase like? Uh, I see that term everywhere. It's a uh, some it's something that makes it so that they light up. Okay. Lucifer means like light or mm -hmm. lightened. Okay. I, yeah. So like that's why they're like yeah, able to detect activity and stuff. Yeah. All right. In the second study, researchers used siRNA to target initiation factor e, uh, EIF or ELF or E, um, a peptide translated in a cap-dependent manner. So, okay. That facilitates the binding of ribosomes to the M7 cap. Um, expression of factor... E, I, F, or E, elongation factor of that, and tau protein was assessed in the siRNA treated cells. Figure three, Western blocked. So let's see, for the negative control, we have, I guess, so the siRNA is, is going to turn off this perhaps and that so i mean i think that's why we have thinner bands there um for the tau oh and then the tau as well so okay l4e cap dependent manner and then elongation factor, and then tau protein. All right, so. Okay. So, uh, all right, let's see what we can do here with these questions. Um, this I know. Uh... Here, yeah. Uh, cyto the cytotoxic protein X23A induces conformational changes in the large uh, ribosomal subunit, reducing production of secretory but not cytosolic proteins, treating neuronal AD mouse cells that overexpress tau protein with X23A would most likely interfere with the binding of. So it'll interfere with the, oh, this is, I see what they're asking. Okay, 
so it's going to interfere with like the larger ribosome right yep so now, the ribosome size for eukaryotes is what uh 60 40 um yeah i think so i think it's you know it, it's it's a weird thing because it doesn't like add up perfectly but i think that it should add up to like 80 i think and um for the bacteria i'm it's less than 80 i think total yeah so okay interfere with the binding of Okay, so I mean, like, mm, would it be B? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because if they if there was something that said sixty, I think that would have been pretty tough. Yep. But this one, we know eighty and 40 and mm -hmm. that it messes with the large ribosomal subunit um but yeah okay now this one the data in figure two suggests that ribosomes interact with the So it's either IREs of construct one and five cap of construct two. So I think it would either be C or D. Mm -hmm. Uh, the okay, let's see the RES thing. They said that was, can you go up on, on the left here? Oh, so, okay, that's in, okay, that's in that. And then this is also there. They, okay, I guess I didn't mention a five, well... Okay, maybe this has something to do with botanists and stuff. Ranilla, I see, I see. The f okay, oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Five cap should be showing us stuff with Ranilla. IRES should be showing us stuff with Photonists, right? Why is that, though? Just because we have our five cap, and then we have whatever, our promoter, and then we have the Ranilla. So if this if the five cap part, like, you know, uh, is involved in the ribosomal translation, then it should uh, 
translate Renilla as well. Um, and if it was translating the IRES stuff, it should uh, translate the Photonist as well. And I think they tell us also, they say that Renilla depended on binding to this set M7 cap. Photonist uh, shows that it, it ribosome binds to the IRES as well. Right? Okay. So that means that for construct one, Photonist and Rosella, uh, Renella. So construct one would have the would be five cap and IRES. And then for construct two, the photonist is basically nothing. So it's not going to be the IRES of construct two. But we do have some Renella, so it will be the five cap of construct two. So I think it'll be D. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. So this had to What's up? Say that again. You hear me? Yeah. So this I didn't really know what exactly like but how to choose between Western blot and RT PCR. Okay. Let's see. Tau mRNA has two isoforms, V1 and V2. A cell line from AD mice initially maintains constant levels of tau V1 and V2 transcripts. Um, and a transcription inhibitor is then added. Of the following, which technique could researchers use to identify the tau mRNA isoform with the longer half-life in the cytoplasm of AD mouse cells. Okay, so if we're looking at like, so isoforms, um, if we're looking at it in terms of like post-translational modification, uh, things that can do with like histones and stuff, those are all, those are proteins. So we would use Western blot for that. But since they're trying to figure out, you know, which mRNA has the longer half-life, we're not going to use Western blot, so we should eliminate B and D to get the PCR, quantity mm -hmm. PCR. Um, and if we're looking for a longer half-life, it would make sense to do it at varying time points. Right. Mm -hmm. When you do RT PCR, you get CT and NA, and then you do pick it a lot, and do you get the mRNA after that? Oh, so, um, uh yeah 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 you can you can take the cDNA and then you know um denature that and then that's where like the TAC polymerase comes in to elongate that sequence and it lets you essentially like amplify um a target gene uh to to be able to detect it but the main thing there was just like. Because if they asked you, like, the two different is isoforms, like, you know, what they look or how they might look like in terms of, like, the pro on the protein level with, like, histones or whatever, then, yeah, we're, we'd be looking at Western blots. But, yeah. Okay. What conclusion can be made from the results shown in figure three? So that's the one where we did the Western blot. AKA looking at um, proteins. Um, so let's see. So we had the siRNA and C 
So if we have an siRNA that silences the target initiation factor, EIF or E, um, can reduce the levels of that EIF or E, as well as E EF 2K and keeps, I guess, tau the same. Okay. Then they said something about, so I would have to connect this to what they said about like, oh, oh, wait, they say in a cap dependent manner. Okay. So A says strongly binds to the uh, one with IRES. I don't think that's relevant here. B says siRNA signals for the degradation of proteins that facilitate elongation of tau proteins. Now these two. Mm, I'm thinking maybe D. Yeah, but why? I was a little confused. Like I didn't know. So, so they're telling us that this EIF4E is translated in a cap-dependent manner. And that's why when we knock it down, uh, we have a smaller amount of it. But we also have a smaller amount of the EEF2K when we knock down EIF4A, I mean, for E. Like when we knock this down, we have a smaller amount of this as well. Mm, okay. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I got you. So they're related, this shows basically. Mm -hmm. All right. The translation of Tau mRNA would most likely involve the hydrolysis of peptide bonds. Shouldn't be that because you're making peptide bonds. Um, tRNA molecules, I guess, like, you know, that would be the only one. But let's make sure. tRNA molecules carrying um, amino acids corresponding to codons in the mRNA molecule. Yep, that's what happens in translation. Um, a ribosomal complex capable of reading the target mRNA in a three to five uh, position. Um, I mean, they can get translated that way, but they would be read five to three. So this should be B. They're read five to three. So are they made, well, how are they made then? Three to five, because of the oh. we talked about the three prime end having that um hydroxyl group. Mm, okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. So DNA is always read five to three and made three to five. Um. So. Uh. Wait, let me um make sure here. So
Okay, so. Um, okay, so sorry, it's so for DNA polymerase, it reads from three to five, but it synthesizes five to three. So the reason for that is the same reason that I told you about the three prime end, but that would mean that the end here is from that um, five, let me get a picture. Um, so I always, yeah, I always thought it was red three to five and made five to three. Mm-hmm. So here, um, okay, here's a picture. So um, on the left, you can see like the five prime end being like on the top, on the very, very top and the three prime end on the bottom. So it still involves that three prime end, you know, OH group, like forming a bond with the phosphate backbone. So you need that three, three prime end, but that doesn't mean that you're synthesizing three to five. You're still synthesizing five to three. It's just that that three prime part is the end of that, um, that like primer or that e existing sequence that you're adding to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it does synthesize five to three, um, but it does, but it reads three to five. Yeah. So then why is three wrong? That was my issue. So it's probably wrong because it's talking about, uh, let's see. Um, so, cause like what we just talked about is like DNA replication, but this is talking about, um, like RNA, uh, translation. And with that, since you have like the, um, like the anti-codons, I believe that means that you're going to then have to read it in the reverse. Oh, yeah. I don't, I'm so confused though. Like, so I was always taught that it's read three to five. And yeah, here they're saying, here they're saying it's they're at five to three. Mm hmm. Yeah, and that's just because if we look at that tRNA, th I think they have that up here, that di this diagram. So the thing that, so this is, so it five to three is what is true for like DNA replication, um, RNA polymerase, pol uh, polymerization. But in translation, we have the mRNA, 
that like whose codon a tRNA with an anticodon will bind to. So it's really going like by the anticodon, right? The ribosome really reads it going backwards. Mm -hmm. It's going from left, yeah, left to right. So, yeah. here we go. Um, oh. Um, oops. Okay, put another picture in the chat. Yeah. And you can see that, you know, this. Okay. Yeah. And so you could see that the 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 mRNA is slide is sliding like to the left with that five prime end on the left and the three prime end on the right, and it's sliding to the left. So and it's being read by not necessarily like the polymerase, but by the ribosome. Mm -hmm. For translation, it's gonna be read. Five to three. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Awesome. So let's see. When would you want to meet next? Uh Tuesday. Um, do you have any other times? I don't think I have any availability on, on Tuesday the 13th. Um, but I do for, I have some spots on Wednesday. I'm pretty open on Thursday and Friday. Um, yeah, I mean, Wednesday at 3.30. So I end with someone at 3.30, so I can do like maybe like starting at, I don't know if it'll, how much it, it'll go over, but let's see. I could put, yeah, I could put you in between like 3.30 and 5.30, unless you wanted a longer session. If so, we can do Thursday. Uh, it would be hard because I have like a doctor appointment <laughs> like in the middle of the day. So, okay, probably Thursday three thirty. Oh, okay. I mean, so, sorry, Wednesday three thirty. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna put you in for Wednesday three because I finish with someone at three thirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got it. Put you in for three forty five. And what's the latest we could go? Let's see. We could do 90 minutes, an hour and a half. Okay. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Awesome. So, yeah, it'll just be like the 150 for today. And uh, good to hear sure. that, you know, you, you're, you know, you, you have a, a plan for the uh, January date. We can probably like, uh, maybe like next time, like, adjust your schedule to reflect that but okay. uh, yeah awesome so yep i will see you next uh wednesday 3 45 p.m eastern okay thank you All right, take care. Yeah. Bye.